your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment? Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. Modern humans, there's been 109 billion of us born on the planet. There's about 7.7 .7 billion of us alive today. We have well-documented evidence that five people have lived past 117. So statistically, the odds of you living past 117 today are about one in 20 billion. The odds that you'll live somewhat less than that are greater than that. Life expectancy in 1900 was 47 years old. Today it's 78. That's an increase of 31 years. But what's interesting is that adults in 1900 lived an additional 12 years on average, and today 19. That's just a seven year increase, and 85 year olds live just two years longer. So where's the 24 year difference? If adults today are living a little longer than they did in 1900, what explains this dramatic increase in life expectancy? And of course, it's a reduction in infant mortality. In 1900, 160 baby, babies per thousand would die from waterborne illnesses, mostly, or infectious disease. Today, that number is less than seven per thousand. So for every child that doesn't die in infancy and lives to adulthood, it adds 65 or 75 years to the curve, and of course that shifts the curve to the right. In fact, of the 31-year increase in life expectancy, 24 of it is due really just a reduction in infant and childhood mortality. Seven years, everything else combined. So if you're thinking today that the miracles of modern medicine are gonna allow you to live a long and healthy life, you may become somewhat disappointed. The fact is that if it was just about money, how much money we spend on healthcare, we should be the healthiest people on the planet because we spend two and a half times as much money per person than, for example, our colleagues in the Organization for uh, Development in, in Europe, but we're not. If we look at life expectancy, that is how long a person born today is likely to live, we lag. If we look at, maybe more importantly, healthy life expectancy of the time that you're going to be alive, how long will you live healthfully, fully independent, functional, we lag. So life expectancy is 78, but healthy life expectancy in the United States is just 69. People spend 9.4 years debilitated and 17 years in poor health. You are not likely to live forever. However, what you can do is live until you die. Where we have probably the biggest potential impact is reducing that amount of debility so that you spend your life well and have a, what we call a good death too. That is, you uh, go to sleep one night and don't wake up once you reach your genetic potential. So in the United States and industrialized countries, we spend billions of dollars on the leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. But what we don't focus on are the actual causes of death the reason people get heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And perhaps the reason why we're spending more money with less benefit is because we're not focusing our attention on the actual causes of death, which include the use of tobacco, alcohol, and an animal and highly processed food diet. Tobacco certainly leads the list. Tobacco is really fabulous when it comes to premature death and disability because it affects almost every organ system of the body. 
So people think of lung cancer when they think of cigarettes. And that's why they think, well, maybe it's dangerous because you'll get lung cancer. But 80% of smokers never get lung cancer. How dangerous can it be? The reason why 80% of smokers never get lung cancer is because they die from heart disease before they live long enough to grow their tumors. I'm always thinking that perhaps what some enterprising cigarette manufacturer should do is come up with a way of making their product even more deadly. So everybody dies of heart disease. And that way, perhaps, they could advertise it as cancer safe. Blood pressure elevations, which are also epidemic, are another major actual cause of death, particularly because of their contributions to heart attack and stroke. And look at this alcohol, one of the major contributing causes of death. And yet today, if you read the paper, you'd think alcohol is some type of health food, that if you don't drink, you ought to start. They'll tell you that uh, there's powerful antioxidants in, in red wine. Where do these powerful antioxidants in red wine come from? Specifically, the skin of grapes. So if you wanted resveratrol, you could eat some grapes. Or they'll tell you that alcohol thins the blood. Much, uh, so it'll reduce your risk of stroke. Is that true? Absolutely. Alcohol thins the blood much like aspirin does. So if you're on a greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, decaying flesh diet and you're at risk for a clotting stroke and you drink alcohol, you have a slightly lower risk of dying from a clotting stroke. You don't actually have a lower risk of dying. Because what happens is you have an increased risk of a bleeding or a hemorrhagic stroke, so all-cause mortality doesn't go down. But if it's important to you that you die from a bleeding stroke rather than a clotting stroke, perhaps alcohol should be in your diet. Notice cholesterol on this list. Cholesterol on this list is there because it's a marker for how much animal food you eat. The higher your animal food consumption, the higher your risk um, for death. Being overweight, it's not health promoting. Low fruit and vegetable intake, just not eating enough fruits and vegetables is a major actual cause of death, according to the CDC, in large part perhaps because of the protective phytochemicals and other factors that you find in plant-based foods, uh, unlike animal foods. Physical inactivity, illicit drugs, and unsafe sex, top off the list. Now, you notice none of these are deficiency syndromes. These are not lacks of pills, potions, powders, or treatments. These are conditions of dietary excess, dietary and lifestyle excess. Are we getting fatter? In 1986, shortly after I started practice, there wasn't a single state in the United States with greater than 14% obesity saturation. But to, you know, by 2016, everybody was beyond that. In fact, now they've come up with some new colors here with 35% saturation. We're not just getting fatter, we're also getting sicker. The conditions associated with dietary excess, including things like diabetes, are increasing geometrically, particularly amongst our children. And if you look at the correlation coefficient between increasing obesity and increasing diabetes, the correlation coefficient is almost one to one. It's almost like there's some type of connection. So what we're doing about it as a society is telling people to eat health foods. And they'll tell you things like olive oil and red wine and dark chocolate and coconut anything, diet sodas, the dead Dr. Atkins diet, whatever. They'll give you all kinds of good advice about health foods. But what we really should be focusing on are not health foods, but healthy foods. And healthy foods are whole, natural, plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, a whole plant food, SOS-free diet. SOS stands for the international symbol of danger and also includes salt, oil, and sugar. So if we think back from an evolutionary standpoint, human beings evolved in an environment very different than the one we live in today. We evolved in an environment of scarcity, an environment where it was difficult to get enough to eat and not get eaten. In fact, most human beings that have been born on the planet of that 109 billion um, did not live long enough to reproduce. Most humans died from predation, starvation, they're what we call the losers. They're not your relatives. Your relatives were the ones that got enough to eat and didn't get eaten. 
they're the ones that survived. And they survived because they had very specific characteristics. Our ancestors learned to use tools. They used fire for light, heat, and to process their foods for over half a million years, longer than we've been humans in this form. And perhaps the most powerful tool that the planet's ever seen showed up around 100,000 years ago, about the time of modern humans, when language allowed us to accumulate information and pass it on in a geometric fashion. The modern human brain versus the brain of an ancestor 100,000 years ago, according to anthropologists, are identical. That means the brain in your head today is essentially the same brain that was in the head of a modern human 100,000 years ago. Now that turns out to be important because remember, you, you are the byproduct of the survivors, the people that had certain characteristics that allowed them to survive. But they survived in this environment. This environment of scarcity, where getting enough to eat was a critical imperative. And they ate foods probably that looked very much like this. But now we live in a different environment. Because of human innovation, we've changed the environment. And now we eat food that's often processed in places that look like this, with products that look like this. So the fact is that you eat a very different diet because we changed a different environment, that the brain that directs your behavior is exactly the same brain that was in the, in the humans 100,000 years ago. And that brain directs the body to engage in behavior that favors survival and reproduction in a natural setting. Your brain is perfectly designed or evolved to help you survive in a natural setting, not the setting you live in today. The way the brain works, simplistically, is it will reward your body when your body engages behavior and that, and that uh, favors survival and reproduction. So, but one of the way the brain does that is it secretes chemicals, one of which is dopamine. Dopamine is the neurochemical associated with the experience you and I know of as pleasure. The more dopamine, the more pleasure. There's only two behaviors that human beings had to engage in in order to survive and reproduce. And it, not coincidentally, there are two behaviors that naturally are involved in the intense stimulation of dopamine production. What are the two behaviors that humans have to engage in in order to survive and reproduce? Food and sex. Food and sex are the only natural, normal, concentrated stimulants of dopamine. Food and sex, food and sex, food and sex, unless you happen to be a male human, then it's entirely different. <laughs> but whether it's food and sex or sex and food, these are the normal natural stimulants of, of, of dopamine production. But human beings, being the innovative creatures that we are, we discovered a way of artificially stimulating this dopamine cascade. And one of those ways is drugs. People like drugs, including alcohol, because of the way it makes them feel. And the way it makes them feel is because it stimulates dopamine production. And the more dopamine production that's stimulated, the better you feel. The more dopamine production, the better something tastes. Cocaine is a good example. Cocaine is a powerful stimulant of dopamine production. In fact, what's interesting about cocaine is if you quantify it and you figure out how much uh, dopamine production is secreted by the brain when you have an orgasm during sex and compare it to how much is secreted when you smoke cocaine, cocaine results in 10 times the dopamine secretion of an orgasm during sex. Some years ago I was speaking in LA and I was talking about this topic. An older woman, probably her mid-80s, she stood up and she said, excuse me, Dr. Goldhammer, where do I get cocaine? That's not the point. <laughs> now, if that was the end of the story, we could just say, okay, drugs are bad, just say no. But it turns out there's a little bit more to the story. There are specific chemicals, for example, that can be added to the feed of animals that will artificially stimulate dopamine production in the brains of those animals, lead to systematic overeating. For example, if you take rats and give them unlimited access to their food of choice, their rat, their rat chow, and 
get genetically uh, identical rats and give them the same food but put these chemicals in the feed, the rats given the chemicals will increase their body weight 49% in just 60 days. Now, did the rat get fat because of psychological reasons? Did that rat get fat because mommy didn't love him enough? Or daddy loved him too much? Did he have stress of work? Or, or is it biological reasons? Did they get fat because they artificially stimulated the, do the dopamine production cascade in the brain that resulted in systematic overeating? Yeah, it's biological, not psychological in this particular case. What are chemicals that you can add to the feed of animals that will artificially stimulate dopamine production and lead to systematic overeating? You all recognize this molecule. Sugar. Yeah, sugar doesn't exist in this concentrated form in nature. You have to manufacture it. And now we consume over 135 pounds per year per person of this chemical. Now, I don't eat any of it, which means somebody's eating my share, too. Hopefully nobody in this room. We've increased our use of high fructose corn syrup, which processes very much like alcohol does in the liver, by over 1,000% since 1986. But we don't know why our kids are getting so fat and people are becoming obese. It's a complete mystery. What's another chemical that you can add to the feed that will increase overeating? Recognize this? How about if we do it, show you a picture of it? What's that? Oil, including olive oil. What's worse is we take this substance and we heat it to high temperature and then we use it to like soak up grease into otherwise perfectly healthy product like potatoes. We call them potato chips and french fries. Fried foods, I tell my patients, look, rather than eating fried foods, what you should do is find the deep fryer, stick your head in it and suck. Because that's essentially what you're doing when you're eating those fried foods. What about another chemical that we add to food, sodium chloride or salt? Salt creates a bit of a problem. But people say, well, wait a second. They understand oil because it's got nine calories per gram. And they understand sugar because it's concentrated empty calories. But salt doesn't have any calories. What's the problem with salt? Well, one of the problems with salt, besides the increased blood volume and high blood pressure and the fact that you get edema and swelling and congestive heart failure and increased risk of osteoporosis, and changes in your microbiome. Another major problem with salt is it stimulates what's called passive overeating. So if you were to eat till you reach natural satiation, eating a product, for example, like rice, and then compare it to eating it when it's salted, you'll find you eat more before you feel satisfied when things are salted. And so as a consequence, it can be a major contributing factor to obesity, even for people trying to eat an otherwise health-promoting diet. 93% of all the calories consumed in industrialized countries now come from either animal foods, that's meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy products, or chemicals added to the food, the form of oil, salt, and sugar. So 7% of calories now come from fruits and vegetables. Now, I know many of you are vegans, and you look at that because you're naturally an optimist, and you say, well, wait a second, 7%? There's still hope. Let's keep hope alive. Yeah, I don't mean to rain on your parade, but of that 7%, a third of its potatoes served almost exclusively as french fries and potato chips. The reality is that fruits and vegetables don't even make a statistically significant percentage of the diet of people in industrialized countries. They are now the, the decoration on the plate. It's called the pleasure trap, the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. And it just coincidentally also happens to be the title of our book, The Pleasure Trap, a disturbing book that does not tell you what you want to hear but does tell you what you need to know if you want to get and stay healthy, and also why it's going to be so difficult to live in a world designed to make you fat, sick, and miserable and overcome the forces of evil that are going to try to undermine your success. So the way it works with food is essentially by caloric density. The higher the caloric density, the more dopamine is secreted in the brain, the better you like the food. Why was your brain designed as a calorie detection device? Think back to the world of our ancient ancestors, an environment of scarcity. Those that got enough to eat survived. Those that didn't died. It was more valuable to be able to identify the very, very rich foods that were more likely to get you through that scarcity environment. Salad doesn't happen to be one of them. Salad has 100 calories a pound. Now, How many pounds of salad would you have to eat a day to survive on salad? about 20 pounds a day. 
Now, if you start at 6 in the morning and you don't stop eating till midnight, can you eat 20 pounds of salad a day? No, you can't do it. So your brain is not stupid. So when your brain sees salad, it says, oh yeah, salad, great. Yeah, I'll have some salad till some more interesting food comes along. But it's not getting excited about it. Because salad, nutritious that it is, rich in fiber, water, vitamins, minerals, doesn't have a lot of caloric density. So therefore, it doesn't result in a lot of dopamine stimulation. On the other hand, fruit has 300 calories a pound, three times the caloric density. So fruit will taste better to people because it has sugar, but the sugar stimulates more dopamine production, so higher caloric density. Potatoes, rice, and beans at 500 calories a pound, you only need four pounds of those a day to survive, rather than 20 pounds of salad. So when you're hungry, you're going to be drawn to the more concentrated foods. Totally makes sense. What about if we introduced a food that does not exist, of course, in nature, but had 1,200 calories a pound? Do you think people would like it? If we introduced it in the World's Fair, do you think it would get rave reviews? And what if we called that food ice cream? If you take ice cream and you melt it down to room temperature, it's described as sickly sweet. Why is ice cream sickly sweet when it's warmed up to room temperature, but it tastes so good when it's cold? What's it, sucking sugar out of the atmosphere? No, it's got the same amount of sugar whether it's hot or cold, but you're not designed to detect things well when something's frozen. You've never fallen in an ice cream pond. This doesn't exist in nature. This wasn't part of your evolutionary tree. And as a consequence, to make ice cream perceived as sweet and tasty, they have to super saturate it with sugar. When you warm it up, it makes you sick. It makes you just as sick when it's cold. You just don't know it because your normal filtering mechanism is being short-circuited by this artificial presentation. What about a food with a higher caloric density than ice cream? Do you think people would like it? And do you think they might even call it the staff of life? Have you ever seen this stuff? Crusty on the outside, all soft on the inside. 1,500 calories a pound before you turn it into a butter boat and melt coagulated cow pus all over it. <laughs> have you ever been into a restaurant and they have a basket of it on the table? Yeah, it's all covered over. You smell it and your brain goes, ooh, 1,500 calorie a pound. Give it to me. <laughs> what do you do? You have a piece or two or three, don't you? What do you notice about the bread in the basket after a while? It's gone. It's all gone. And so what do you do? You spread that napkin open, get that naked basket, and push it right to the end of the table, don't you? Waiting for the waiter to come by to, to see that you're out of bread. Pretty soon the waiter comes along and says, oh, did you want some more bread? Now first you have to pretend like you didn't know it was empty, and you look over there and say, oh, yeah, sure, why not? What are you really thinking? Does this guy want a tip or not? And they bring you some more bread. Do you ever go into the same restaurant and say, excuse me, waiter, I'd like three large baked potatoes because I want to eat those before I order my dinner. Do you eat three large baked potatoes before you order your dinner? Why don't you eat three large baked potatoes before you order your dinner? Be too full because the human stomach is only big enough that you put about three baked potatoes, that's about 500 calories of potato, it's going to fill up the human stomach mechanically full there wouldn't be any room left. On the other hand, 500 calories of bread only takes about a third of the stomach because it's three times the caloric density, about 500, 1,500 calories a pound. So what do you think it's easier to get fat on? Sugar, pure sugar, is 1,800 calories a pound. You can take just about anything, put enough sugar on it, and people think it's good. Do you ever go into that restaurant, that same restaurant, and they have the sugar on the table? Do you ever take 11 of those packets and just <laughs> Why not? It's free. The stuff is so cheap they don't even charge for it. Why don't you have 11 packets of sugar before you start perusing the menu? Have you ever had one of those? 12 ounce Coke. How many teaspoons of sugar? Yeah. So yeah, 11 on the old one. The new stuff, maybe a little more because they figured out how to get it to stay in solution, I think, with more phosphoric acid or something. 
Don't use cocaine anymore now they use caffeine. It's probably more effective. Now, it used to be that a, a Coke was a special treat for a kid. Not anymore. Now it's a, a big gulp, a super big gulp, a double gulp, and an express gulp with free refills, and pretty soon they're going to need to use a bucket. <laughs> That's right. And do you know in the future, chiropractors are going to mostly be treating people after they got a soda pop at the... Yeah. 25% of the calories of teenagers, according to some studies in the United States, come from the sugar and soda pop alone. Just sugar-sweetened beverages is responsible for up to 25% of the total calories. But we don't know why the kids are getting fat and sick. It's, it's a mystery. Ooh, what tastes better, salad or chocolate? Now, is that a cultural thing? If we took 100 people from 100 cultures and blindfolded them, mouthful of salad, mouthful of chocolate, you'd think they could tell the difference? 2,500 calories a pound. I tell patients, look, instead of eating chocolate, what you got to do is melt it down and then rub it all over your belly and hips where it's going to end up. And then when you're done, at least you can wash it off. There was a survey of women, not men, just women. They asked women, what would you rather do, have mad, hot, passionate sex or eat chocolate? And the two most common responses were, what kind of chocolate and how many pieces are we talking about? <laughs> the pleasure trap is the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. Essentially what's going on is, here is we're overstimulating the dopamine cascade in our brain by adding chemicals to the food. It leads people to systematic overeating and that's why people are getting fat and sick. That's the heart disease, the diabetes, much of the cancer autoimmune diseases, this is all coming back because we're fooling our brains into allowing us to overeat because we're living in an environment different than the one we were evolved to survive in. So what do you do about it if you're caught in the pleasure trap, if you're an addict and you're addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine in your brain, whether it comes from drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, snorting cocaine, or eating chemicals added to your food, is there a way out? Yeah, it turns out there is. Uh, Today, fasting has become uh, more popular, talked about, particularly intermittent fasting or limited feeding, where you narrow your feeding window. We certainly encourage that. We practice that at True North Health, where you, know, you have breakfast, you have lunch, you have dinner, but that pe period of feeding might be eight or 10 hours a day, so that you have 14 or 16 hours of fasting every single night. And just that period of deprivation every night, cumulatively, is thought to induce some of the changes that we're gonna be talking about today with another type of inter intervention called long-term water-only fasting. The advantage to intermittent fasting is you can do it yourself safely. You don't have to modulate your medications. You don't need a doctor in order to be able to guide you through that. Long-term water fasting is a disadvantage because it does need to be in a controlled setting. But that's what we do at the True North Health Center, and that's what I want to talk to you today a little bit about. The fasting I'm talking about is the complete abstinence of all substances except pure water in an environment of complete rest. Unfortunately, it turns out that that rest is an important component. As we'll learn, when you go on a fast, you eventually deplete your glycogen or your sugar stores. And if you continue fasting, you will either burn primarily fat or you'll burn a combination of fat and protein, depending on how active you are. If you continue to force the body to produce uh, and utilize glucose by being too active mentally or physically, the where that source is going to come from ultimately turns out to be protein. Whereas when people rest, they're able to derive primarily their fuel from fat. In order to determine who's a good candidate for fasting, there's a few things that need to be done. A history exam and laboratory evaluation, actually really important, because one, you wanna rule out the people that are not good candidates for fasting, and number two, you have baseline data, so during fasting you can tell the difference between a good thing and a bad thing. Sometimes the good things and bad things look alike. The body generates an acute response, as it attempts to heal itself and to tell the difference between that's a good healing crisis and that's a problem developing, it often helps to have reliable data to fall back on, including physical exam and blood testing. Some things that we don't fast for would include if you're pregnant or you're lactating. If you're lactating, you could fast, but you'll lose your milk production. Not a good thing for you or your baby. Um, if you're pregnant, um, we avoid uh, fasting for obvious reasons. Conditions like anorexia or nervosa, a neurological condition, uh, uh, make poor candidates for fasting. Type 1 diabetics don't make insulin. Insulin is an important component in being able to fast. So although 95% of diabetics are type 2, they may do well fasting. Type 1 diabetics 
uh, typically will not fast. If you've had a recent stroke, MI, pulmonary embolism, or DVT, fasting is not absolute protection against these problems. You'd be at increased risk, maybe even uh, in part because of the physiological dehydration that occurs in fasting and other issues. Cardiac instability, atrial fibrillation, severe kidney disease, porphyria, deficiency, depletion, cachexia, or MCAD. MCAD is medium chain acetylcoenzyme A dehydrogenase deficiency. And that's a genetic defect where you don't break down fatty acids, so you wouldn't be a good candidate for fasting because you would start vomiting and die, and it would be really bad for our outcome data. So we test everybody and make sure that they don't have that very rare condition. It's about one in 10,000 people. If you can't get off your medications, there's a big problem because medications are often potentiated during fasting. And so you have to first go through the process of weaning medications. If you just arbitrarily discontinue many, many medications, that can be a very serious or life-threatening problem. Um, not getting off medications and trying to fast can also be complicated. So with patients with medications, the first step is appropriately withdrawing their medications. But remember, most people are not medicated for their condition. Most people are medicated for their diet. And the day you change your diet is the day that your need for medication begins to start to change. And most patients are able to be successfully weaned off medication in a controlled setting. Um, and as I mentioned, the inability to obtain adequate rest would be an, a contraindication for fasting. So conditions favorable to fasting in, obviously include diseases caused by dietary excess. If your disease is caused by dietary excess, it's not shocking to find out that fasting helps undo the diseases of dietary excess. So obesity, conditions like cardiovascular disease, particularly high blood pressure, as we'll learn, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune disorders. Remember what autoimmune disorders are. are. They're your body attacking yourself. That's what causes the joint changes in rheumatoid arthritis. It's your immune system. Your immune system becomes confused, as we'll talk about later, and attacks itself. And it turns out fasting is very helpful at helping get the body to stop attacking itself. The traditional way of treating autoimmune disease is to shut down the immune system with powerful drugs like prednisone or methotrexate. The problem is, at first, that's like a dream, because your pain goes away. And then it becomes a nightmare, because it turns out you need your immune system. And when you shut the immune system down, with these powerful drugs, the long-term consequences are devastating, sometimes even worse than the condition that you're trying to treat. Some types of cancer, like lymphoma, um, GI disturbances, and, and impact on the microbiome. We believe that we're going to, uh, research that we're doing right now is investigating the effect of the fasting on the microbiome, the, the thousand strains of bacteria that live in the gut, and also how those gut bacteria behave. You know, it's what they're pooling in you. You want your gut bacteria pooling fertilizer into you, not toxic waste like TMA, which is going to become TMAO as it's processed in the liver. And so we believe that fasting may be helpful in rebooting the mechanisms, much like taking a computer with a corrupted hard drive. You know, you turn it off, you turn it on, a lot of stuff sorts out, you don't know exactly why. We're trying to figure out that why right now. And obviously, dependence and toxicity, sometimes people are cigarette smokers and they have trouble quitting. But in fasting, most patients within just a few days report no, no withdrawal cravings. Those cravings go away very rapidly in fasting. Now, some people say, yeah, they're so miserable fasting, they don't think about cigarettes. But it actually is because the whole metabolic cascade of withdrawal is just greatly facilitated during fasting. Fasting duration ranges from 5 to 40 days. So I tell my patients that are needing to do really long fasts, especially these 30, 40 day fasts, that Moses, David, Elijah, and Jesus fasted for as long as 40 days, so they're in good company. And no, we don't teach people how to part the Red Sea. But if we did, it would be in the wrist action. Average fast at the True North Health Center is one to three weeks. And some patients require multiple fasts. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have the type of non-invasive diagnostic uh, testing that allows us to predict how long a person is going to fast in order to reach uh, clinical uh, satisfaction. And that's why we have a really flexible policy. People can book however long or short they want. There's no penalty for getting done early. So we tend to overbook stays, and then they can adapt uh, to whatever actually turns out to be the need. I'm going to give you an example of a case report. Um, this particular patient was a 42-year-old female diagnosed with follicular lymphoma, which is a type of lymph cancer. It was stage 3 because you could feel large uh, tumors, both upper and lower 
extremity, you can see the sizes of the lesions that were demonstrated by CT scan. She'd undergone a, what's called a guided core biopsy, a surgical excisional biopsy, confirming the diagnosis. Um, her flow cytometry is listed there as well. So this patient went to her family doctor, and the reason she had been tracked for two years is because the treatment for lymphoma um, is not shown to extend lifespan, has a lot of side effects. They often will delay treatment until there's really, you know, kind of where it's much farther along. So her doctor had monitored her for two years. It continued to progress. And finally, he told her that it was time to see the oncologist, that she needed to undergo uh, chemotherapy, radiation, whatever. And uh, she asked the doctor, what about dietary change? And he assured her that diet didn't matter. It didn't matter what she ate. She could eat whatever she wanted. Diet didn't have a relationship to this condition. She asked her doctor, what about alternative therapies, including fasting? And her doctor told her that fasting was criminal quackery. So when she went to the oncologist, the oncologist confirmed that it was time to start chemotherapy. Um, she asked the, the oncologist about diet, and he, he told her that he didn't think diet would make any difference, that she could eat whatever she wanted. She just had to eat plenty of nutritious foods. And she, he asked her about fasting. He said he didn't know anything about fasting. And so given that tremendous medical support, she decided to come to the True North Health Center, where she underwent 21 days of water-only fasting, during which time her tumors disappeared. She had 10 days of refeeding when she was sent back to the oncologist at the medical school with some coaching. And the coaching was about how to manipulate her doctor into making sure he did a follow-up CT scan. So she went back to the doctor, and he examined her a couple times, checked her chart, checked her picture on the chart, checked her picture, and asked her what happened. And she said she went to the criminal quacks, and she did the fasting, and the tumors all went away. And he said, oh, well, that's interesting. I'll have to give them a call. And then she said she'd like to get a follow-up CT scan to objectify the changes that have occurred. And he was a little bit nervous, and he said that she didn't need any CT scans because she was better now. And she said that she'd really like to have a CT scan and what if there's some cancer lurking just beneath the surface? And then he said, okay, fine. <laughs> Order the CT scan. Now, during this fast of 21 days, she lost 22 pounds, which is about typical, about a pound a day is average weight loss during fasting. So she went from 174 to 152. She resolved her tumors, and at two-month follow-up, she was 139 pounds. Now, how did she go from 152 to 139 pounds after fasting? She's back eating. What's she eating? A whole plant food SOS-free diet. And I explained to her if she didn't stick to the diet, it could be deadly because I would track her down and kill her. <laughs> so she followed the program. We know she followed the program because she told us and also we could see the results. She maintained um, her weight, but she was still neutropenic. And, and the, uh, that means her white count was still a little bit too low. Her doctor actually had suggested perhaps they could do some gentle chemotherapy. And um, she suggested that maybe they wouldn't do any chemotherapy, that she'd like to see what would happen with following the program, which she did, and by six months, her white count had normalized. Um, at a year, we decided, okay, this was very good. She's done well. She's maintained these results. It's time to write up a case report. And so I, I called my colleague, Dr. John McDougall, and I said, hey, you know, I've got this interesting case report on lymphoma re resolving with fasting. And he said, ah, but do you have objective data? I said, yeah, we've got the follow-up CTs. And he goes, oh, OK. Well, maybe you should try submitting. I said, I think I'd like to submit it to the British Medical Journal. And he said, no. He said, that, don't submit it there. It's, they're not going to publish it. You've got to go to a smaller impact journal. So given his wise and sage experience, I, of course, immediately submitted it to the British Medical Journal. <laughs> and fortunately, after a little bit of uh, back and forth, we were able to get it published. Uh, this was about three years ago. So, but before it came out, they asked us why the oncologist hadn't signed on to the case. So I wrote to the oncologist and I said, doctor, thank you so much for all the support you showed in referring your patient to True North Health Center for medically supervised fasting. And as I'm sure you expected and you know, have witnessed, your patient's gone into full remission. And now we're so looking forward to working with you in the years to come and tracking her long-term success. And since our paper's been accepted for review at the British Medical Journal, we'd like you to sign on as co-author of the study. Yeah, he didn't get back to me on that one. Yeah. 
So then what we did was they uh, invited us to track this person long term because they said, look, a certain percentage, a very small percentage, but a certain percentage of lymphoma patients will go into spontaneous remission. Maybe it uh, wasn't just uh, the intervention, even though, yeah, it's progressed for two years. It resolves in 21 days, but, you know, still could be a chance. But why don't you do a long-term follow-up? Because even in patients that spontaneous remit, they usually don't maintain long-term success. So we continued to track this patient for three years, and during which time, fortunately, she was compliant with a whole plant food SOS-free diet. And then we brought the patient back in, had, uh, th uh, before I get to that, I'll show you this. These are the um, before and after CT scans of the first fast. You can see the large masses. You don't need to be a radiologist to see these changes. Uh, that was the uh, paper. You can, if you go onto our website, healthpromoting.com, um, you can find all of the information on the True North Health Center. We also have, a, there's a new website out called fasting.org. And fasting.org is a fasting compendium site with all of the research on fasting, including this paper that you can read, Water-Only Fasting and Exclusively Plant Foods Diet in the Management of Stage 3 Low-Grade Follicular Lymphoma. Um, at three-year follow-up, she was 136 pounds, maintained her weight loss, and she had a full-body CT that showed no lymphoma. So after this CT was done showing she was completely free of cancer, what we did was we did a follow-up fast of another three weeks, and she continues to be cancer-free to this day. We submitted this paper on invitation to the British Medical Journal, follow-up of this patient, and it was rejected initially. Two reviewers, one reviewer said, oh, interesting follow-up, great recommended publication. The other said, eh, she's probably just lucky, not worth publishing, and recommended rejection. Fortunately, on appeal, the editor overrode that opinion, and they did publish this just recently in 2018 in the British Medical Journal Case Reports. <laughs> high blood pressure, one of the major contributing causes of death and disability. The consequences of high blood pressure are devastating, and the majority of people that are 65 or older in this country have high blood pressure. As much as a third of all people have high blood pressure. Blood pressure is measured with two numbers. The top number, systolic blood pressure, represents the pressure of the blood in the vessels when the heart contracts. The bottom number, or diastolic blood, it represents the pressure in the blood when the heart's in its relaxed phase. Each is an independent risk factor for all-cause mortality. Each predicts your likelihood of premature death and disability much more sensitively, for example, than cholesterol or other common measures do. Blood pressure is very sensitive because it represents almost every organ system in the body. High blood pressure and its conditions, as I said, are the leading cause of death and disability in industrialized countries. For example, 5.7 million people get congestive heart failure. That's where the heart muscle loses integrity, and when it pumps, it doesn't pump the blood out efficiently. So if you have congestive heart failure and you lay down, your lungs can fill up with fluid and you can drown, which is why people with congestive heart failure often have to sleep sitting up. The major contributing cause of congestive heart failure, high blood pressure. Almost 800,000 people will have strokes, high blood pressure, major cause of stroke. Most people develop it during their lifetime, which means if you're 65 and don't have high blood pressure, you are abnormal. Because the average or normal people have hypertension. 42 million visits to physicians, and it's a leading justification for prescription medication. This is worth billions of dollars to the industry. Drug intervention, unfortunately, largely disappointing. The improved outcomes are really only those people with the very highest levels of hypertension, where it slightly reduces risk of stroke. The majority of heart attacks and strokes from high blood pressure occur in people that do not have blood pressure high enough to justify medication. Now, why don't we just put blood pressure medication in the public water supply, since it's such a common disease? Why don't we give everybody high blood pressure medication? Because they're dangerous drugs. In fact, if your blood pressure doesn't rise to a certain level, you are higher risk dying from the blood pressure drugs from the blood pressure itself. That's why people with a blood pressure of 138 over 88, who have five times the risk of dying of a heart attack, aren't given medications. Because more people would die from the drugs than that level of hypertension. The definition of hypertension was the level at which the risk from the drugs um, was outweighed by the benefit, and that only happens when blood pressures uh, rise to a certain level. 
for every point you reduce your systolic blood pressure through diet and lifestyle change, it said you reduce your all-cause mortality risk about 1%, according to Pito from Cornell. And that risk reduction may go all the way down to as low as 90 over 60. This is how we manage blood pressure. One, two, three, five different medications. Um, and of course, the medications have all kinds of side effects from chronic cough, fatigue, impotence, and death. The one promise you make when you go to the physician is that if, they, if you go on these drugs, how long will you take them? For the rest of your life, your doctor will guarantee you, you will never get well, you will be sick forever. That's the promise. Because they know the blood pressure drugs have nothing to do with getting rid of the cause of blood pressure. What does get rid of blood pressure? Well, we know that weight loss does. This chart represents thousands of studies, including meta-analysis. For every kilogram of weight you lose, there's a 1.6 point average drop in systolic blood pressure. You lose a bunch of weight, that can help lower blood pressure. Vegetarian high fiber diets, independent of weight loss, are associated with a reduction in blood pressure, as is getting rid of alcohol. Alcohol is a major risk factor for high blood pressure. It is not health food. Exercise will reduce blood pressure seven to eight points, which is almost as effective as any combination of medications, which average a 12-point drop. The problem with medications, of course, they do reduce blood pressure, they do reduce risk of stroke, et cetera, but they have all the secondary effects. John McDougall did a study at St. Helena Hospital where he got an average drop of 17 points, combining these variables. We were able to do a study with T. Colin Campbell from Cornell University that demonstrated an average of 37-point drop in blood pressure with medically supervised water-only fasting. And that was a paper that we published in JMPT and uh, is available on our site. You can read this study. 174 consecutive patients with high blood pressure, 174 people achieved blood pressure enough to eliminate the need for medication. And in stage three hypertension, people you could justify medication on where their average systolic blood pressure starts at 180 or more, the average effect was 60 points. Now remember, the baseline was taken on medication. The conclusion, they're all off medication. So it's 60 points plus whatever effect the medication might have been having at suppressing their baseline. That's the largest effect that's ever been shown in any study in treating high blood pressure in human beings. It was published by the True North Health Center in conjunction with T. Colin Campbell, uh, medically supervised water-only fasting in the treatment of hypertension. Moderate levels of hypertension responded proportionally. We spent 12 years collecting the data, processing it, being rejected by 30 medical journals before it was finally uh, published. Um, the second study we did only took 12 months, medically supervised fasting and borderline hypertension. These are patients that you can't justify medication on, but it represent 68% of the people having heart attacks and strokes. And of course, their reduction in blood pressure was proportional. Uh, this, these fasts ranged from five to 40 days. All the subjects experienced uh, normalization of blood pressure. And um, this was published in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. Um, after we published these first papers, we were approached by the International Union of Operating Engineers, California's most powerful labor union. These are the guys that build all the highways, and they've got a lot of um, 68,000 members. They spend a lot of money in treating high blood pressure and diabetes. And Dr. Lyle, our psychologist, and I were invited to present the results of our data to uh, a meeting of their administrative staff because they were interested in possibly making our program a covered benefit for the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 3. And so we went to the meeting, and they had a big group in there, and they had all kinds of representatives. One guy was an NIH reviewer for the National Institute of Health. One was an actuary that does all the calculations about what stuff costs, including their retirement benefits and their medical costs. They had representatives of the contractors that hire the union guys, and then they had some of the union guys there. And we presented our data. And uh, as you can imagine, it was a little bit controversial. The contractors were objecting to the fact that we were asking for a program to be covered, that they were already spending too much money on healthcare, and they thought they shouldn't have to be paying to send people to a resort. And then I explained what happens during fasting with low back pain, headache, nausea, vomiting, skin rashes. And eventually, they interrupted me and said, OK, fine, it's not a resort. You know? But they still objected. The NIH reviewer was helpful. He said he had analyzed our research, and he said he thought it would save money, that they were spending you know, $66 million a year at that time treating these conditions and that getting people healthy would probably be cheaper than putting them in the hospital and cutting their feet off for their diabetes and treating their heart attacks and strokes from their blood pressure. And 
The funniest thing was at one point, the actuary who had been running numbers throughout the thing said, Dr. Goldhammer, these gentlemen each get a retirement benefit when they, when they retire, if they live long enough. If we do your program and it works, won't it dramatically increase our costs of paying them retirement benefits by making them live longer? I know. <laughs> didn't, didn't know what to say. I thought, oh my god, they really think like this. I didn't know. I'm just like, uh, mm -mm. and then a guy stood up who I knew was a crane operator because his leg, his neck was like twice as big as my thigh. And he said, listen, little man, you should remember who you work for. He said, you work for us. He says, why don't you do a calculation? Figure out how much money we're going to save when I come back there and break your neck. Then they voted unanimously to make our program a fully covered medical benefit. Any member of the union or their family could come to the True North Health Center, no cost, undergo fasting for the treatment of high blood pressure or diabetes. But they asked us to do a study in order to determine whether it actually was saving them money. So we did. We took the first 30 consecutive members with diabetes and hypertension that they sent us. They, lost, they were with us an average of three weeks, lost 26 pounds. I'd follow up, they were down 28 pounds, so they'd lost a little bit more. The systolic blood pressure and diastolic had been largely sustained, and the union saved more money in the first year than the entire cost of the program. So they extended that. We went on for over 10 years doing this, working with this union member, over 100 union operators. But the interesting thing was the very first guy they sent us, the very first guy they sent us, they didn't tell him what the program was. So he's got 220 over 120, capped out on five medications, carrying a keg around on his belly. No idea what he was going to. He thought he was going to get a sixth medication. Right? So you know, he shows up at our place, and he's like, oh, I'm in the wrong place. I said, no, I got your name on the list here. You're OK. He goes, no, I'm in the wrong place. I said, no, you're here to get well. He goes, that's not me. I'm not sick. So now I'm a little pissed. It's like, what do you mean you're not sick? You're diabetic, hypertension, you're 100 pounds overweight. I said, you're going to die. He goes, yeah? Well, aren't we all going to die? <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> I said, yeah, but you're on $880 a month worth of medications. We get you healthy, you won't need those medications. He said, what do I care? I don't pay for my drugs, my union does. At this point, I realize he's not my highly self-selected, highly motivated, typical hardcore vegan patient that I'm used to dealing with. You know. And I'm thinking about his medical history, and I thought, well, let me try one more thing. And I said, you know, what happens to diabetic hypertensive males that are on a lot of drugs? So I said, well, you know, get you off all those meds, we might be able to do something about your little problem. So he stands up, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, because he's a pretty big guy. And he said, why the hell didn't you just say so? <laughs> so far, so good. Got his attention. So he's telling me that uh, you know, his um, diet is essentially triple cheeseburgers. So, and that's what he's been eating right up to the time you know, I said, so we better feed him a little bit, you know, before we start fasting, because, you know. So I give him some food, and he's trying to eat the food, but he's like, <laughs> <laughs> can't swallow. I, I think, oh my God, maybe he's got a tumor. So I sit down next to him. I said, looks like you're having a little trouble with the food. And he said, what food? Is it this? It's not food. He said, this is disgusting. He said, if I have to eat, taste the swill like this the rest of my life, I'd rather just die. He says, why don't you go out to my truck and get my 12 gauge when I'm not looking, just shoot me in the head. So we checked him in. I ended up fasting 26 days. He lost 50 pounds, normalized his blood pressure, normal, got him off all his meds, did, did great, changed his attitude. Afterwards, he's eating the food. He's actually eating it. So it looks like you're doing better with the food. He said, yeah, you're a damn chef finally getting the hang of it. <laughs> it took me 20 minutes to convince him. It's the same stuff you ate when you come. He goes, no, when I came in, that stuff was disgusting. He said, this stuff's not bad. He wouldn't have complied a day. 
not even a meal, had we not had to get a chance to neuroadapt him, you know, get him to where the food was tolerable to him. I saw him six months later at a semi-annual, we're doing blood pressure screening for the union, he was, he was there. I said, how are you doing? He goes, I'm doing just fine. <laughs> so True North Health Foundation, our nonprofit research foundation, is involved in research and education. We've recently completed a study, actually it's being analyzed this week, the data, taste and adaptation. We actually were able to detect minimum thresholds to sugar and salt. We were able to investigate how tastes change, why it is guys like this go from the food is disgusting, tasteless slime that they can't choke down to being able to enjoy it. Because we believe that part of the change actually occurs to how you perceive um, food. We had 21 subjects to test for minimum threshold. Um, we're also looking at changes in the microbiome, the, the several pounds of bacteria that live in your digestive system that are breathing, respirating, and pooing in you constantly. We're also looking at changes in biomarker after fasting, including the number of mutations in B lymphocytes, and the efficiency of autophagy itself can be measured now. And we've done a study with Washington University, a gentleman named Luigi Fontana, where we took uh, subjects and we took their blood samples and stool samples before, during, and after uh, long-term water-only fasting. And again, that's being analyzed right now at Washington University. Uh, we're anxious to see the results of that. We published a paper, uh, it's called A Case of Non-Pharmacologic Conservative Management of Suspected Uncomplicated Subacute Appendicitis in an Adult Male. So we took a guy that was scheduled for surgery for his appendicitis, and instead of going to surgery, we put him on a water-only fast, managed to resolve this problem, and showed a two-year follow-up and got it published in, a, in a, one of the journals. Um, Mostly just to piss people off, you know. <laughs> it just shows you, I mean, th this is an, uh, an extreme example, but there's many conditions that normally you, would, you wouldn't think there's any options other than surgery, but in fact, in some cases, uh, conservative management can be an effective alternative for people that don't want to do uh, more aggressive uh, treatment. This paper, this is a great title, Exclusively Plant Whole Food Diet for Polypharmacy, that's excess drug use, due to persistent atrial fibrillation, alteration of heart rhythm, ischemic cardiomyopathy, in other words, enlargement of the heart, lack of getting blood flow to it, hyperlipidemia, too much fat in the blood, hypertension, high blood pressure, in an octogenarian, a person over 80 years old. Basically, we took a guy who was your diabetic, or uh, hypertensive, atrial fib, um, uh, dementia uh, symptoms, put them on a whole plant food, SOS-free diet, and watched him wake up. And once we got him off all of his drugs, we stabilized him and wrote up this case report. What was interesting is one of the reviewers' comments, when they, and they did publish it, this is uh, British Medical Journal, uh, they, uh, one of the reviewers said, well, that's an interesting case, but what made you think it was the medications? Uh. This paper was a challenging case in clinical practice, long-term relief from chronic post-traumatic headache after water-only fasting and an exclusively plant foods diet. This dentist had been at a conference and got hit in the head with one of those outdoor tent poles and suffered uh, post-traumatic brain trauma. And one neurologist told her he thought the problem was there was some type of dural tear and it was inflamed and she got her drugs and she went to treatment and nothing worked. And when we saw her, she'd had 16 years of constant daily head pain without relief for 16 years. Pain from 8 to 10 out of 10. Uh, she had been through all the normal Neurontin and pain medications and the rest of it. Nothing had been successful. So in desperation, um, she decided to undergo medically supervised water-only fasting with the hope that somehow that might help reboot her system. She went through 19 days of fasting with absolutely no relief whatsoever. But on the 19th morning, she woke up with a very strained sensation. It lasted about five minutes, and it was the first time in 16 years she was out of pain. Then the pain came back and continued till we eventually terminated this fast. This was supposed to be a 40-day fast, but in her case, we made a very rare exception. We went to day 41. At day 40, she said, look, I need to go one more day. And I said, why is that? And she said, because the men fast for 40 days. Moses, David, Elijah, Jesus, and she said, women, we always need to do just a little more. 
So she went for 41 days. At the end of the 41 days of fasting, she still had some prodromal symptoms, but no acute head pain. So we refed her, we spent six months rebuilding her, and then we fasted her again for 40 days. So she did a 41-day water-only fast, six months of refeeding, a 40-day water-only fast. At the end of that time, she had no headache. She's now had seven years with no cephalgia. So that real question is, well, okay, fine. So some people get better fasting, but is it safe? Is fasting safe? Can you really put people on water only fasting for up to 40 days safely? So to answer that question, we began to do a study, and that study is a fasting safety study. It was eventually published here, the MCP uh, company in alternative medicine. This is about a year ago. Looks like 2006. No. What's the date on there? 2018, so six months ago, not six years ago. So in this study, what we did was we took five consecutive years where every patient, every day, every symptom was carefully charted utilizing uh, a, a specific standard um, that's used for safety studies. Uh, it's the common terminology criteria for adverse events from the National Cancer Institute. So we used their standard and collected their data. The, the CAETCAE grading system is, uses five grades, mild, moderate, severe, four is life-threatening, and five is death. So you have to mark every patient every day, all of their symptoms according to the standard. It was quite exhaustive. It took a lot of work on the part of our staff to do this because this was before we had our fancy automated computer system that we now have. And we found there was 5,949 adverse events during fasting. Most of those were mild to moderate. Unfortunately, as you can see, there was zero category five events, no deaths. There was one category four event. That's a potentially serious event. That was actually a hyponatremia event. The person's blood sodium went low enough that we had to put intravenous fluids in in order to bring it back. The person did fine, but potentially a serious event. On the category three events, of the 310 events, 95 of them were hypertensive crises. Now, what's interesting is you think, well, why if, if blood pressure's, I mean, fasting's so good for treating high blood pressure, why would you have a hypertensive crisis during fasting? Well, the way it works is every day you have a blood pressure over 160 is considered an adverse event according to the CATAE criteria. So if the person starts off at 220, and the next day they're 200, and the next day they're 180, and the next day they're 170, each one of those numbers, each one of those days is an adverse event. So even though they're clearly getting better, it still counts as an adverse event. So you have to read the fine line on how this stuff is done. And in this case, you know, a third of our Category 3 events were actually people's blood pressure normalizing. 95% of events are mild to moderate, and most importantly, they are expected during fasting, low back pain, headache, nausea. These are all things that are generated by the body in the process of getting well. They're not um, clinically adverse problems. And what's interesting, up till the time we did the study, first of all, nobody could get approval from Human Subjects Committee to do long-term water fasting because there had been no safety study done. And no Human Subjects Committee will approve a study if there's not a safety study done. That's kind of the first thing that has to be done. So we were able to do that. And up until that time, nobody over 65 years old could be allowed to fast because they were too old. How many people over 65? So they would say, you're too old to fast. Well, we did this study and we found out that there, although there was a slight correlation between age and adverse events, there was not a correlation between severity and adverse event, which means there was no more danger because you're older than younger uh, to do fasting using this protocol. And as a consequence, now people are able to get a broader range of patients able to, to do this in a federally chartered IRB uh, because we have safety data that supports um, its use. So this was actually a really important um, study, not just for us, but also for all the other researchers now that are showing interest in long-term water-only fasting. Now, since then, we've actually found, funded our own sponsored IRB. We have a federally uh, chartered IRB with federal-wide assurance 
with people that are staffed, that know stuff about fasting. And so we can submit to that IRB now for future studies, and there's experts that actually can evaluate patient safety um, without going through some of the long delays uh, when people are just terrified of the idea of somebody not eating. People are so afraid of fasting, they think if you get on a plane here in New York and you fly to California, you will die over Colorado if you don't eat the peanuts. They think those pretzels saved their life. So how is it that fasting is working? How is it possible that doing nothing, essentially, can be the most effective treatment that's been shown in treating the leading cause of death and disability? What's going on here? What percentage of people lose weight that fast? 100%? That sounds quacky, doesn't it? But it's true, the laws of physics and thermodynamics tell you if you don't fast, you're going to lose weight. Everybody that fasts loses weight. Average weight loss a pound a day. Everybody that goes and fasts and gets a naturesis. The selective elimination of this toxic chemical sodium, also essential nutrient sodium, from the body. When people have too much of it in there, it comes out very rapidly. This is a much more powerful effect than taking something like hydrochlorothiazide or some diuretic or something. You get a flushing. That's why people see dramatic weight loss sometimes early on because not only does the salt come out, but the excess fluid that's there to protect your body from the excess amount of salt comes out. As the fluid goes down, the blood volume goes down, so blood pressure goes down, the swelling, the non-healing wounds start to heal, the congestive heart failure starts to ease. Are people really toxic? Is that true? Are there like PCB and dioxin and pesticide revenues and heavy metals built up inside your cells? And does that matter? Yeah, it turns out it does. And in fact, fasting is so efficient at allowing the body to mobilize and detoxify itself that some people try to tell you it's dangerous, unless you take their proprietary products. They're going to tell you, sell you some $39 a bottle pill that somehow now makes it safe. Well, we found actually the body is very well equipped to rapidly mobilize and eliminate these materials um, without having to take $39 or $139 products in order to make it happen. There's two types of toxins that you're concerned about, exogenous and endogenous. Exogenous are the PCB, pesticide residues, all that stuff. Endogenous are normal intermediary products of metabolism that may be there in excess quantity. Okay, and so it turns out fasting is helpful at mobilizing all of these materials rapidly. It's also why sometimes fasting can be an intense and miserable experience because you're rapidly going through this detoxifying process. It's not always fun. It's what I call entertaining. Fasting protects normal cells. According to Walter Longo, published in the journal Metabolism 2015, the combination of fasting and chemotherapy results in dramatically higher cancer-free survival than chemotherapy alone. In other words, if you combine fasting, fasting protects healthy cells from the ravages of chemotherapy. Fasting makes cancer cells more vulnerable to treatment of all kinds. Enzymes are used both for detoxification. How do you think those toxins get out? It's all enzymatically driven. Fasting induces those enzyme systems. And fasting is also induces the enzymatic systems necessary for things like fat mobilization and glycogen mobilization. You know, lipolysis is an enzymatically driven process. Every time you fast, you get better at detoxifying. And those enzymatic pathways that are canalized persist even after fasting. You're not just detoxifying when you're fasting. You're detoxifying the days, the weeks, the months after. And if you do something really dangerous and radical, like adopt a whole plant food SOS-free diet, get regular sleep and exercise, you can continue to detoxify faster than you accumulate the toxins, particularly if you get off the greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, decaying flesh and highly processed foods. The whole point is as long as you're getting healthy faster than you're getting sick, you get well. If you're getting sick faster than you're getting healthy, then you, it's called aging, deterioration, and death. Fasting is a useful tool at rapidly reversing this process. And we know it's true in animals because you can take rats and you can double their lifespan with periodic fasting or systematic underfeeding. In fact, if you look at the life extension protocols that are out there, the only thing that's been reliably shown to extend life in animals and humans is calorie reduction and fasting. There is no pill, potion, or powder that's been shown reliable to function on a life extension basis. Insulin is a hormone that drives sugar from the bloodstream into the cells. What happens if you can't drive your sugar to the cells where it's needed? Blood sugars go up, we call it diabetes. That's what diabetes mellitus is. You have enough insulin, it's just not working. And remember, your primary fuel, your natural fuel, what you're designed to burn is sugar. And the best way to get that sugar is from plant-based complex carbohydrates. The problem with taking sugar in a simple form is it causes havoc because it disrupts the microflora, it drives your insulin levels, you get a completely different kind of reaction. 
Even something like fruit, which are hybridized to be high sugar, lower fiber foods, need to be taken with vegetable material, lettuce, celery, cucumbers, fiber, to slow down the rate with which the sugar is absorbed for those of you that are sensitive to that type of an issue. So if we're giving um, fruit to patients, it's usually in moderate quantity and also with lots and lots of vegetable materials. If you just take a lot of fruit or you process it in the form of juices and things, you can create some of the same problems we see from too much refined carbohydrates across the board. So we believe that fruit is an acceptable food for most patients, but it has to be used in concert to a vegetable-rich diet. Gut is a tunnel that goes from your mouth to the other hole at the other end. So when you swallow something, it is not in your body. It is in a tunnel that's going through your body, okay? Starts in the mouth, go down the throat, into the stomach, goes to the intestine, the large bowel. Eventually, you're pushing it out the other end. That's essentially what digestion is, shoving stuff in one hole, pushing it out the other. It doesn't get in your body unless it gets through the intestinal mucosa, represented here by, like a, by the screen, that works very much like a screen does keeping flies out. The intestinal mucosa keeps everything out, except the tiniest molecules, like even protein molecules, too big. It has to be amino acids. Glucose, it has to be small molecules, unless the screen is damaged. And just like a screen that's torn could let flies in, if you have a damaged intestinal mucosa, you can leak materials in, larger molecules, whether it's bacteria, viruses, proteins, and that would stimulate your immune system to have to react to try to suppress it. Well, that's okay as long as your immune system is able to keep up with it. But what if it's happening every day? Eventually, you can develop what we call autoimmune disease where now the immune system becomes confused and attacks your own tissues. What could cause gut leakage? What could cause damage of your intestinal mucosa? What's an example of something like, what about free radicals? What do you think causes smoker's face here? Why the person of the smoker looks like one side and the other? Can you tell the difference? Yeah, what causes wrinkles? What are wrinkles? Wrinkles are cross-linked collagen tissue that comes from free radicals. One of the best sources of free radicals is smoking. It bathes your entire body with free radicals, which is why only 20% of smokers live long enough to get lung cancer, because they damage the animal lining of their blood vessels and get heart attacks and strokes before that. You have an autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system is the automatic nervous system. It controls virtually every movement in your body. The things you don't have to think about. If you went out running and you, your heart didn't speed up, you would die. Does anybody die because they forget to tell their heart to speed up? No, it does it automatically, and what controls that is the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system has sympathetic and parasympathetic branches which work in concert with each other. If your sympathetic nervous system tone gets too high, you could have diarrhea if the, or constipation. If the parasympathetic tone uh, gets too high, you could have uh, uh, um, con uh, diarrhea so the, because the peristalsis is regulated by the sympathetic and parasympathetic you know, balance. So what could you do to rebalance the autonomic nervous system? Well, you could do one of the many healing methods that you all hear about, like chiropractic manipulation, physical therapy, um, meditation, yoga, biofeedback, homeopathy, all of these different therapies, acupuncture, largely work to the degree they help rebalance the autonomic nervous system. You know, some may work better than others, but basically that's one of the mechanisms by which they relieve your symptoms and your pain. But by far the most powerful way of rebalancing the autonomic nervous system that I've ever come across is fasting. Fasting is like taking a corrupted hard drive, rebooting the hard drive, and watching what happens. It's really quite remarkable. Psychospiritual impact. Isn't it interesting that diametrically opposed religions all have one thing in common? Whether it's the Jain, the Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, they all agree there's a fasting tradition in every one of these practices. Maybe there's a reason because it changes the way you think about yourself and the world around you. The immune system is enhanced, not suppressed during fasting. Every objective measure of immune system function from helper killer T cell activity to neutrophil phagocytosis is enhanced during fasting. And as I mentioned to you with my story about my guy that lived on triple cheeseburgers, taste and adaptation is profoundly affected. People get to where good food tastes good. So in summary, fasting effects Fasting decreases glucose, and it decreases IGF-1, which is insulin growth factor 1. And the lower the IGF-1, the lower your risk of aging and death. Fasting decreases blood pressure, heart rate, insulin, inflammation, oxidation, and total microbial load. It increases leptin, the satiety hormone. That's why after fasting, everybody thinks, oh, they're going to be ravenous and want to eat the world. No! 
You find you're more easily satisfied because your leptin levels have normalized. It increases insulin sensitivity and, in, and cellular stress resistance. That's the idea that cancer cells are more vulnerable to the body's immune system or exogenous treatments and fasting, and healthy cells are protected from some of the ravages of conventional treatments. It increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. BDNF is the chemical associated with the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. If you take rats in a cage, one has the ability to exercise because it has a wheel and the others don't, everything else is matched. The ones with the wheel have dramatically lower dementia rates and they've discovered it's because brain-derived neurotrophic factor goes up with exercise. It also goes up with fasting. In fact, if you look at all the chemicals associated with exercise that are thought to be beneficial, they also go up with fasting. Why is that? Why would exercise, which is vigorous, and fasting, which you're resting, cause some of the same neurochemical changes? Perhaps, my opinion is, because both exercise and fasting help undo the consequences of dietary excess. Exercise and fasting both are working to undo the consequences of dietary excess, and undoing the consequences of dietary excess is what we know is associated with improving the quality and quantity of our lives. Fasting normalizes the gut microbiota, it stimulates B-cell immunity, and it reverses all major abnormalities of metabolic syndrome. It is perhaps the most powerful tool that's appeared at helping sick people actually get well. So if you want to learn more about this, read our book, The Pleasure Trap. I think there's a few copies over here. Um, there's also an audio version for those of you who'd rather listen than to read. Chef AJ did a great job of, of doing this in the studio, it's, and it's really well done. You can get the, the discs, or you can get it on audio or any of those other formats. For those of you that want to know, is fasting something that could be useful to you? One of the services we offer at the True North Health Center is a free conversation with me. If you go onto our website, truenorthhealth.com, fill out the registration forms that gets me your medical history information, you can call me, I'll talk to you about whether or not this is something that might be relevant to you, I'll give you whatever suggestions I can, there's no cost for that. Um, I have some cards if people want to get them for me afterwards, you're welcome to do that. Um, we also have a couple of vegan SOS free cookbooks, uh, the Health Promoting Cookbook and the Bravo Cookbook, all of these are, you can read about these on our website for those of you that are interested. If you know a doctor that would like to do something worthwhile with their life and go to heaven instead of hell, they can come to the True North Health Center and complete our internship or residency program. There's no cost. Uh, we provide room and board and training to any doctor that wants to learn how to use uh, fasting in a health-promoting vegan SOS-free diet to help their patients get well. Uh, they're with us either for a month, three months, or a year, depending on the type of uh, program that they're entered into. Uh, and uh, we have about 30 doctors a year that are training now, so hopefully soon there'll be a lot more people doing something worthwhile with their life. Okay, I have uh, apparently uh, nine minutes and 55 seconds, so if people want to ask some questions, I'll be happy to do my best to give you some answers. Why don't we start right here? I'll repeat the question. Okay, so the question is, is there any way to find a doctor in your local area um, that, you know, thinks on, on these lines? And um, the answer is yes, there are, um, depending on specifically what you're asking, if it's plant-based nutrition, there's groups now uh, that you can get on the internet of plant-based doctors. As far as doctors that are experienced with fasting, the best strategy right now today would be to go to um, fasting.org, uh, the website, and uh, contact us and we'll try to help you find the local, the person most local uh, to you. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, this is all pretty cutting edge, innovative stuff right now. So it's really just starting out. And so, you know, there's not a, a huge number. So we do have people in Florida, Ohio, Southern California, and the True North Health Center um, as well. So whoever's got the mic, we'll let you. Uh... I'd like to know about your protocol for um, Parkinson's. Okay.
Um, Parkinson's disease is an interesting condition. Um, the only effective way of managing some of the symptoms of Parkinson's is the use of L-DOPA. And L-DOPA can come from drugs. It also can come from natural sources in the form of mucona. The problem with L-DOPA is if you give enough to control the tremor, you get extreme nausea. And the way uh, medical care manages this is they give you another drug called Cardopa. And it controls the nausea, but the problem is it irreversibly binds vitamin B6 and over a longer period of time leads to all kinds of terrible changes from dementia on down. So a lot of the increasing death rate you see in Parkinson's now may very well be from the medications that are used to manage it. There is an alternative way of managing it. Um, diet and fasting alone are usually not enough to resolve that problem, and so we resort to a protocol that was developed by Marty Hines. We have two doctors in our facility that have been trained by Marty Hines at using amino acid loading, nutritional supplementation in conjunction with mucona to manage the condition. We found it's very effective. It uh, uh, doesn't have the risk profile that's associated with the use of Cinemet and other medications. And so we augment diet and lifestyle change along with this exogenous uh, treatment in order to manage Parkinson's. We've been very satisfied with the results. Yes, sir. Are you, are you having any success with, or what would you recommend for someone with chronic kidney disease? Well, chronic kidney disease presents a particular problem. You need a certain level of kidney function in order to be able to do water-only fasting. So in our facility, if creatinine levels are over about 2.0, we typically won't do water-only fasting because the load on the kidneys from fasting can exceed its adaptive capacity. So in those cases, we have to go a much slower, gentler approach, which really involves using the whole plant food diet and, and lifestyle factors. And so it's not as dramatic and quick and exciting as water-only fasting is, but you can still get improvement. And sometimes we can get enough improvement that then the person's capable of going through fasting at a later point if they are able to make enough recovery. But, but severe kidney disease, as we mentioned on the, on the profile, can limit your ability to do fasting. And that's one of the important things that you need to remember with fasting. It's a very intense process. And if you don't match the process to the appropriate patient, you can get some pretty bad outcomes. And I get those calls from people, well-meaning but misguided docs that have tried to use fasting in an inappropriate way, and they've really created a mess of things. We don't want that happening right now because otherwise you get a lot of bad publicity about fasting when it's really people just doing stupid things. Yes, sir. Uh, there's been very recent research showing that 12-hour fasting, you know, between dinner and breakfast increases beneficial bacteria in the, in the microbiome. Have, have you looked at the relationship between 12-hour fasting and, and the microbiome? Yeah, well, we, we recommend actually 16 hours of fasting as a routine for all of our patients. We feed patients at about 8.30, we don't feed people after 5, 5.30. And we believe that that period of time may actually be beneficial. As far as the specific effect on the microbiome, that research is just, we're literally just waiting for the data analysis right now. It's fairly complicated because you're analyzing literally a thousand different strains, of bacteria, trying to understand what that means. It's all pretty virgin data. So we don't know scientifically yet what the results are. We know clinically that there seems to be some benefit. And we're assuming that it's, it's tied to improvements here, but I can't say with certainty that that's true. I've, I wanted to know if um, fasting could help for uh, cure a hernia. Yeah, no, fasting will not cure a hernia because a hernia is a mechanical distortion that's, that's not going to be amenable uh, to, to water-only fasting, so the inguinal hernias or that type of thing, that's not something that we see uh, resolving in fasting. And I want to know what's with kombucha. Is that alcoholic? Yeah, we don't recommend uh, kombucha. Well, um, when you're doing a water fast, are you taking everybody off their medications? If someone yes. was doing thyroid, so you take nothing. So in order no to fast, nothing. with the exception of a few exceptions, like thyroid medications, dosing is modulated but may be left on. We, we, we're going to wean down all of the medications prior to initiating water fasting. Medications can become greatly potentiated during fasting, create all kinds of trouble. And fortunately, since most people are drugged for their diets, not their condition, what happens is as you change the diet, the need for medication is progressively reduced. Most of our patients were able to get off the medications and stabilize them in a controlled environment, and then we initiate uh, water-only fasting. Sometimes we'll start with a more modified program like on juices or other things, 600 calories of vegetable-based juices, where we can safely wean somebody off. But that's why we have uh, four medical attendings and a naturopathic physician as well. So we have every patient that comes to our center has an intake examination with a physician. They're seen twice a day by staff doctors, minimally. 
Um, we have three educational classes a day. They're very carefully monitored in a controlled setting. And then everybody that goes through fasting has a period of progressive refeeding. And it's, it's really done specifically to the limits of that individual. People fast from five to 40 days. We don't know ahead of time exactly how long that's necessarily going to be. Thank you. That was great information. Any so, special kind of water we're fasting on? We use purified water. We happen to use fractionally steam distilled water because it's the purest water we can get. But you could use any highly purified water and likely get excellent results. Uh, we, we've had. How about a back condition, a chronic back condition of about 40 years? Could that be cured? Well, I don't think anything can be cured. Honestly, you can't cure obesity. You can lose the weight and keep it off, but if you go back to eating greasy, fatty, slimy, processed food, you're going to get fat again. If you can't cure high blood pressure, you can normalize blood pressure and you may keep it down forever, but if you go back to the things that cause it, you're going to get it back. And back pain is no different. If back pain is contributed mechanically because you're overweight or detoned or have inappropriate core strength, unless you correct that problem and maintain that, you're not going to get rid of it. If it's an inflammatory process, fasting may be very helpful. If it's a mechanical process, we do... We have doctors of chiropractic, osteopathy, physical therapy, trying to do manual therapy type things can be very helpful. So, you know, back pain is a broad uh, diagnosis, and fasting in some cases is a useful part of its treatment. Honestly, they tell us that the True North Health Center should be re the True North Health Center, the last resort. Because oftentimes the back pain that we're seeing is the people that have been through all the conventional outpatient treatments, and they're coming in. And honestly, our chiropractors often say, you better treat them right away. Because if you wait till they're done fasting, there's often nothing left to do. Yes? Yeah, no stevia, no honey, no bee vomit. Here's the way you tell it. If you look at something and you don't know, here's the technique. You go inside yourself and you ask yourself, do I really want to need the substance? And if the answer is truly yes, you know. You can't have it. You get nothing. Thank you.